Today's lecture is on dry docking and critical draft. So we talked a little bit last lecture about grounding. And now we're going to see some of the fundamental differences between grounding and dry docking. Um, one being that, of course, dry docking is planned, where, where grounding is not normally. And you can see here that this vessel is actually being fully supported by its hull on this rock that's here. And at the end of the day, we are going to actually do the same thing with a vessel that is being dry docked. However, we're going to do it in a controlled manner. And it normally wouldn't result in the captain losing his license or job. You can see this vessel here. Like, I literally have no idea how this vessel is staying up because it's, um, it must have just perfectly landed on this rock. And of course, we have tidal ranges when you start grounding something as well. And as the tide goes down, the buoyant force that's normally supporting the vessel disappears. And now this vessel here that we're looking at is being completely supported by the rocks and what we would call our reactant force or the R value for a grounded vessel. An eagle, of course eagle, she's currently in the middle of a huge renovation process, millions of dollars. So every summer when she goes back to Baltimore, or after every winter, I'm sorry, she is going up into dry dock and they're doing a ton of maintenance on her. And all of this is planned maintenance. And we're going to talk a little bit about what are the reasons that you would need to dry dock a vessel. So we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about techniques, and we're going to talk about some of the concerns that we have while we're actually dry docking the vessel. And of course, critical draft, which isn't new because the critical draft was an issue when we were talking about grounding, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail here since we have some things we can calculate and we're doing this in a controlled environment. So let's move on and discuss that a little bit. Why do we need to dry dock? Well, like I said before, you've basically got two major reasons. You've got periodic planned maintenance, which means I've scheduled this out for four years and I have this bulk amount of work that I need to get accomplished, and it can only be done if the vessel is out of the water. So some of those items that recur on a four to eight year basis are um, replacing hull plating because it's become in some way compromised via rust or from running into something or um, just any other just wear and tear of the vessel. And normally running into something would be an emergency repair. But that's some reason we would do hull plating. The next would be to replace the shaft, the propeller, or the rudder. Now we do this periodically just to make sure that we've got good working equipment on our vessels. However, we could also be doing these inside of this emergency repair window as well. So the vessel that I was on actually ran aground and tore up the prop and bent the shaft. So we were down here in the emergency repair section while we were doing shaft props and rudder. However, we also plan to replace and maintain those items on a very routine basis. Right, if I need to get into an inaccessible void, a lot of times it's going to require me to cut through the hull to get there. And obviously I don't want to be in the water while I do that. So that's another great reason why I may need to be dry docked in order to do any work in an inaccessible void. Hull preservation. So what do I mean by preservation? I'm really talking about prepping it, priming it, and painting it. So this is sandblasting it, putting down a primer coat, and then putting the final application down. It's really hard to do that underwater. Uh, it, parts of it can be done underwater, however it's very, very expensive and it's questionable how good it is for the environment. So we normally like to do that in a dry dock where we can encapsulate everything, make sure the sand grit and the paint runoff doesn't get into the water stream. So we'll do that in a dry dock. Again, we talked about rudders already up here. So that's pulling rudders. Normally you, you kind of want to be out of the water to do that. Could you do it in the water? Sure. Can you do all of this in the water? Absolutely. The problem is, is how much you're going to spend in putting all the materials together to do it. And the next one is bow propulsion, like a bow prop or a thruster. Now again, this is underwater, so it makes it a lot easier if I can do all the maintenance on this while the vessel is high and dry. So I'm going to want to hold those maintenance items until I get to a dry dock. And again, in an emergency, can I do it in underwater? Sure can. It's just going to be way more expensive. And of course, any type of emergency repairs that compromise any of these items here that we listed are also grounds for a dry dock. And we're going to call it an emergency dry dock versus a routine dry dock, which is what this planned maintenance piece is. So let's move on. There are several ways to skin a cat. Dry docking a vessel is no different. A floating dry dock is something that actually floats 
and it is a boat in and of itself for all intents and purposes. There's a graving dock, which is a big hole in the water that will drive the ship into. There's a marine railway, which literally pulls the vessel out on railroad tracks. Something called a travel lift, which looks like a four-legged crane on wheels that can sling a vessel. And then we have a synchro lift with an additional travel hoist that can be associated with that. Now, a synchro lift is a bunch of electric motors that move a solid platform from down underwater to above water. And we'll look at each of these as we move on. We can see here is a floating dry dock. And if you look, it's pretty much U-shaped. Now this dry dock is currently holding two different vessels, a 378 and what looks like it could be a, um, a destroyer. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what that vessel is. However, these guys over here, these are called wing walls. And these wing walls, as well as all of the bottom that these ships are, are sitting on, are tanks. When I want this vessel to sink, or this dry dock, I fill all of those tanks with water so it gets really, really heavy, and the weight of the vessel is more than the buoyant force, and it will start to sink down. When it gets low enough, and this is just like ballasting any other vessel, when it gets low enough, I will drive my ship into the dry dock, normally via tugs and some sort of winch. I don't normally want my propeller spinning while I'm doing this. I'll move into the dry dock, position it just right so that it's over a bunch of blocks that are going to hold the vessel up, and then I'll start pumping all the water back out so that I decrease the weight and my buoyant force can push us back up. Now, you're looking at these two vessels and they're both bow in with their sterns facing outward. Why would I do that? Well, it makes it a lot easier to be able to pull the propellers and shafts because they're really long. So these propellers go all the way up there to about the midpoint of the ship and that's where they couple with the engine or the marine reduction gear or in this case just the reduction gear. So those have to come out and if you look at this angle they may actually hit the deck if this vessel was one all the way up here maybe its bow was in this area. When I pull these out it's not going to have enough angle or room to actually get these shafts out so I like to put them on the end so while I'm pulling the shafts I can actually have enough room so that the floor of the dry dock bed or this skirt area doesn't interfere with my pulling of the shafts. In addition, if I had them facing the other way with this vessel here, I'd have all these interferences with this other ship trying to pull them out as well. So normally you go bow into these. The other reason that I like to go bow in, and this is for any dry dock, is that I don't have to put my propellers and rudders, which are my main appendages that can get caught up on items, I don't like to drag those over the keel blocks or the side blocks. So if I come in in this way, my propellers transition over hard stuff, so the skirt or wood blocks, the most minimal amount possible. So that's a floating dry dock where they use ballast tanks. Here's a graving dock. So this is a big hole that the ocean is allowed to fill. And we will drive our vessels in and we'll close these big doors, which you can't see because of this vessel back here. And these big caisson doors will close and then we'll start pumping water from this reservoir back into the ocean. And as we do that, the caissons keep all of the water out, and we basically lower our ship by lowering the water level. As it gets low enough, it'll make contact with the blocks that we put in place, and it will now be supported by these blocks instead of by the water on its hull. So that's a graving dock. This is a marine railway. Now this is a pretty small marine railway. This isn't something we would pull a large vessel out on, but the idea is the same, where you build a carriage of some sort for the vessel to sit on, and once the vessel is secured into that cradle, you'll start hauling it with these lines here. You can see these cables. And they actually start hauling this out of the water until it gets to a point where you can work on it and it's completely out of the water. For a large cutter, instead of going bow up this hill, a lot of times we'll put the vessel sideways this way and we'll have multiple tracks so that we can pull the vessel up um, more quickly and have less of an incline for the vessel to actually hit the bottom or to slide back off. So that's a marine railway. So this is a travel lift. Now travel lifts are normally for smaller vessels, although pictured here is a probably one of the largest vessels that you could pull with this travel lift. And it slings a vessel. You can see these high tension slings right here and there's some in the back as well. 
And those are positioned in a way so that it doesn't create damage on the hull, as well as ensures that the load is equally distributed across this entire travel lift. And you can see there's another set of slings down here as well. And it will basically have the vessel drive in. You'll put the slings around the vessel, and you'll tighten them up, and it will pull the vessel up as it tightens. After it's been tightened by the synchro lift, it'll move it into the yard somewhere where it'll place it on solid blocks so that you can do maintenance and use this travel lift again to pull another vessel if needed. And here is the synchro lift. And this has got the transporter part of it as well. So you can see down here, there's a bunch of blocks that have been put on metal trolleys. Now these metal trolleys are on train tracks as well and they will just slide right in place. And this whole platform, starting about right here and right here on the other side, actually submerges down into the water with these trolleys in place. The vessel will then be floated on top and all of these green devices here are electric winches that will actually haul up the entire platform and the ship the entire time keeping it completely level so it never gets off center and tips over. This is a really good device to have because it allows you to pull multiple ships and then move them to some place in the yard so you don't have your only source of getting ships out of the water confined by a ship that's being worked on, which is typically what happens in a dry dock. I can only fit one or two ships in there. In, with a synchro lift or a travel lift or even a marine railway, I have the capability of pulling ship after ship after, sh after ship because I can move them around inside my yard and continue working. So it's a, it's a force multiplier for most shipyards. And here's Bath Ironworks who does exactly that, only they're doing it with a floating dry dock in this case. So you can see their floating dry dock has tracks and they are able to, once they bring their vessel up, lock it in place with their pier face, and they can move vessels into the yard in any of these locations. Now they have a floating dry dock because this guy can be moved in either direction and allow for work to be completed on multiple vessels at once instead of being constrained by just the vessel that's in the dry dock. So, although that didn't go to red. So we have those capabilities in the Coast Guard yard as well. So you can see there's another vessel being worked on right here. So this is something that this vessel will probably either be moved into the yard or stay here if they don't have any planned work. So when we're dry docking something, we're inherently taking a lot of risk. There's a lot of danger involved and safety to the crew and to the workforce is huge. It's an industrial process. People are welding, cutting off big chunks of metal, moving really heavy items. So we always require safety glasses, hard hats, steel toe boots, or, or composite toe boots with steel shanks, and we have restricted areas and things that can't be done in certain locations because we're trying to keep this safety piece up to par. Now we don't want people to get hurt in any case, but in a shipyard, injuries can be extremely fatal, especially if a, a couple ton metal beam falls on you, there's not much recovering from that. In the docking process, there's a lot of risk as well because we're actually taking a vessel and purposely grounding it. And we know that at some point when I'm lifting this vessel out of the water, as the water level gets lower and lower and lower on my vessel, it's not going to be able to right itself. It's going to have no buoyant force acting on the extre extreme parts of this vessel that will keep it from tipping over. So we've got a lot of stability issues that come into play during the docking process and after the docking process. If I'm using a floating dry dock, now I'm not just concerned about the stability of the boat that I put into the floating dry dock, I'm concerned about the combination of the two. So I'm worried about the overall stability of the floating dry dock now that my ship is floating in it because in essence, it's just another boat. So these are my concerns as we move on with the dry docking areas. When we talk about safety, of course fire is an issue. I'm doing welding, allied processes, I don't have as many people keeping eyes on things. I can have electrical fires because they're tearing apart electrical components. Flooding is an issue. Again, I could have sea valves that are detached from the ship that would allow water into the vessel. I may be creating flooding by some of the piping systems that I'm taking apart in my own vessel. I may be flooding the dry dock. It may have some sort of hole or it may be unable to maintain its overall structural integrity to keep water out. Uh, I could have structural damage on my vessel because I didn't load it properly onto the dry dock blocks. Machinery damage can ensue for the same reasons. If I don't properly support my vessel, I could bend and flex and I could destroy machinery. In addition, I could destroy machinery because 
I'm working on items. I can get dust, debris, medical, metal particles into the equipment, and I could cause it to, to have issues down the road. But personnel safety, although listed as number five, is normally a pretty big concern of ours. And this is across the board. You just have to be really diligent when you're in a dry dock because you might have manhole covers that are off. You may have big holes in the deck. There might be a low-lying beam. There's just tons of ways that you could get injured that you would not normally think of when a vessel is in a dry dock. So what do we do? Well, we make sure that everyone wears the proper protective equipment. So we have our PPE, which stands for personal, personal protective equipment. So that's it. That's the hard hats, gloves, safety glasses. If they need to be wearing welding masks, then that's part of PPE as well. Gloves, whatever the case may be, we make sure that everybody involved is wearing the right PPE. Hot work. This is how we try and manage our fire issues. So we have a hot work chit and fire watch management, which means somebody that's not doing the welding or who's not doing the process that involves heat or flames is sitting back monitoring the situation and making sure that nowhere in the area that is being affected is on fire or has hot spots and they'll have fire extinguishers which, with them as well to quickly put out any type of fire that may ensue. Damage control capabilities. In a dry dock we normally don't have a whole lot of fire suppression systems because they'll normally be taken offline so we're relying on municipal water supplies which can be problematic for us because we're used to having tons and tons of water at a very high pressure that we take right from the sea. Well, if my vessel's not sitting in the sea, that's problematic. So I need to make sure I have contingencies in place to ensure that I can still fight any type of damage that ensues on my vessel. Again, awareness in general, just looking around, making sure you're not falling into the manhole covers and that those beams aren't knocking you in the head. So we go through and now we look at the actual docking process. You can see we have two distinct different types of blocks. The ones in the middle here are called keel blocks. Now the keel blocks are the ones that are going to touch first and they're actually going to support about 90 percent of the weight of the vessel. These other these side or bilge blocks out here off to the side are normally going to be pushed way out to the side when the vessel comes in and they'll actually be hauled in to make contact with the vessel once she's resting on the keel blocks. What point do we want to haul the keel block? I mean haul the side blocks in so that they actually touch well, that depends on when we reach our critical draft. And it's something that we need to be able to calculate because we want to do it before then. We want to make sure that we do it before we reach our critical draft. So what are we concerned about when we're talking about stability during dry docking? Well, we're, we're concerned that we are moving some of this buoyant force from the water is now supporting, is no longer supporting the vessel and we have our R value that is, just like when we grounded. And remember our equation uh, that we had the weight of the vessel is equal to the buoyant force plus that R value that we talked about earlier. So our reaction force here. We're going to call R F dock now. So now our equation is the weight of the vessel is going to be equal to the buoyant force plus the force that the dock is providing onto the vessel as well. Now there's really no difference whatsoever in these two calculations. The only difference is, again, is that one is controlled and one is not. <clears throat> so what we're going to do also, and this is a, a, an important thing to understand, is that we're going to treat this F dock as though it is weight being removed at the keel. So this is an important thing. So we're going to say when we do our calculations that this F dock is actually weight being removed from my vessel at the keel. And that's going to help us do our KG calculations and figure out critical draft. And this is, again, the critical draft piece is when I need to determine I need to have my side blocks, blocks hauled in before I actually get to my critical draft. And again, when we're talking about grounded vessels, I have tidal ranges that can present the same issues as raising my vessel out of the water with a dry dock. So we still need to know how to do this even if it's for just grounding purposes. So the, the vessel comes into the dry dock, whether it's a floating or a synchro lift or a graving dry dock, comes in, it settles on the dock, and starts to be lifted out of the water. So you've got these forces, this F dock here acting directly on the bottom, and we've got our buoyant force over here. Now this is an exaggerated uh, list because we're trying to prove a point, otherwise all these arrows would be right on top of each other. And you can see right now, this weight of my vessel is creating a moment, a capsizing moment, 
And the only thing that's helping keeping it up is this buoyant force here. This buoyant force, Fb, is helping keep this moment from toppling me over. So it's important that I have either some amount of buoyant force here or I have my side blocks in place. So as I continue to lift the vessel out of the water, my F doc continues to increase. So this guy here is going up and my buoyant force, the, the overall value of it is decreasing. So its magnitude is decreasing. My weight doesn't change, right? So I'm shifting all of this buoyant force over to F doc. So it's growing, this one's growing and this one's getting smaller. So that's basically increasing my capsizing moment, which is bad because now this buoyant force isn't going to be able to help me as much keep my vessel righted. And since we know that my F doc plus my buoyant force over here is equal to my weight, I know that it's going to continue to happen until there is no more buoyant force. So this means I need to haul my side blocks well before that happens. So if a ship is in this condition, it's going to capsize. It's going to be unable to right itself and it's a problem. So we need to make sure that it doesn't become unstable and start to roll because we need our vessel to be at an even keel in order to do a lot of the maintenance items and plus it's just not safe to have your vessel heeled over while it's in a dry dock. So here's an example of how we're going to figure out what our kg change is. So we want to know what our kg nu is and we have a hundred long ton ship. It's got a kg value given and a tons per inch immersion given and it's going to be dry dock for hull repairs or, or whatever you want it to be. And as the dry docking proceeds, the vessel goes from a mean draft of 9.3, I mean 9 feet 3 inches, to 8 feet 11 inches. So what do we know? We know that F of the dock is equal to my change in mean draft times my tons per inch immersion. And we know this from our grounding calculations. This is the equation that we did before, and it looked geez, I'm sorry, it looked more like T mean draft before stranding minus draft mean after stranding. Well, we know that's just a change in the mean draft. So we can do that here as well. And as we do that, we get a value of 811 to 93 is a difference of 4 inches. So F doc equals four inches and we know our tons per inch immersion is 12 long tons per inch so now we get a force of the dock equal to 48 long tons awesome so that's the first part that we need so now we know what F dock is and we're gonna treat this as though it is a weight removal at the keel remember I said that earlier so our weight removal at the keel now we can just go do our kg new equation where we have kg new is equal to our displacement original times our kg original plus or minus any weight removed or added times its vcg all over our displacement plus or minus any weight added or removed all right so this is our kg new equation just like we did in class so now I'm going to go through and actually put values in it. I'm going to do it over here. Kg new equals my original displacement, which was 1,000 long tons. And I have a, an original Kg of 14 feet. So that's my first value. And now I'm removing weight at the keel. So I'm going to remove 48 long tons, which is my F doc, and my height vertical center of gravity for that is zero because it's at the keel so it doesn't actually have a height and now I'm gonna take my 1000 long tons which is my original displacement minus the weight I'm removing which is the 48 long tons and I'm gonna do the calculations right here and that's gonna give me a value of 14.71 feet so my new kg is 14.71 feet great so now I was able to determine what this kg value was and now I have a process for doing it. The critical draft is really what I'm trying to get to. So why did I do a kg calculation? Well I know that when gm equals zero I am at critical stability. That's my critical draft. So I need to know what my 
kg is because when kg equals km, gm is equal to zero, right? Because we know that gm is equal to km minus kg, therefore gm equaling zero, km equals kg, just like I discussed here. And that's when we're at our critical draft because gm equals zero, neutral stability, that's when things become bad and we are no longer, our ship no longer has the ability to right itself and any external force or even its own momentum can make this vessel roll over and capsize in a dry dock and that's not good. And you can see, here's a correlation. I have my KM, as my KM increases, my GM decreases until I get to this point right here and I can see my mean draft of nine in this case would be where I would be concerned and that would be my critical draft. But let's look at something a little more realistic. So I've got a dock master that has all this information and says, I want to know how far I can drop the water level before critical draft is reached. Ideally, because the dock master wants to haul the side blocks and doesn't want to miss that window and have the vessel topple over. So what do we do? How do we actually go through and do those calculations? Well, you can see here I left in that I need to figure out where critical draft is. So I'm going to make kg new equal to km. That's what I need to do because km equals kg. That's when gm equals zero or we hit neutral stability. So let's do our kg new equation, which again is our kg new is equal to our displacement times our kg plus weight added times its vertical center of gravity minus weight subtracted times its vertical center of gravity all over the displacement plus weight added minus weight subtracted, right? So now we've got this new equation. And we already know what kg nu is going to be because it's 17.5 feet. It's given right here, km. We're like, okay, when km equals kg, that's when we got a problem. So let's figure out what my overall f doc is so that I can find out what my critical draft actually looks like. So now we've got our kg equation. I'm just going to go through here and put our 17 point five feet is equal to our 800 long tons times the kg value of 16 which is given above minus the weight subtracted so we don't know what that weight subtracted is but we know it's going to be called f doc and we know it's going to be times zero in this case no weight added okay so now I'm going to come down here I'm going to go 800 minus f doc so this is a pretty simple equation. This is zero, so that's no big deal. I can quickly find out that F doc is equal to 68.6 long tons. So this is just by doing simple math and using this kg nu, as using the km value for kg nu. I can quickly go through and figure out what my force doc is. So that's the first part. Like force doc doesn't help the doc master because the dock master is looking at drafts. So now we've got to figure out a way to put this into drafts. So we're going to use our F dock equals our mean draft before stranding minus our mean draft after stranding times TPI in order to figure out what our draft our critical draft is going to be. And since we already calculated when GM equals zero, what F doc value gives us a GM of zero, now we can put this into our equation. 68.6 .6 can go right here in the X doc. F doc is equal to my value that I have, my mean draft before stranding minus my mean draft after stranding times my TPI. What's my TPI? Is four long tons per inch. I also know what my mean draft is before stranding, but we can stop there for a second. So we'll make this mathematically easier. So now I can just take this four and divide it by the 68 point. So divide by four, divide by four, and I'll get a value of 17 point two inches is equal to 
my mean draft before stranding minus my mean draft after stranding. Okay, so now I know what this equals, and I also know that I have a mean draft before stranding. So I know that the draft is 7 feet 7 inches. So now I can substitute 7 feet 7 inches in for mean draft before stranding, and I can calculate my mean draft after stranding by simple subtraction. So if I take this 7 feet 7 inches, I subtract out the 17.2 inches, I get a critical draft of 6 feet 1.8 inches. And that is now my critical draft. And that's the value that the Doc Master was looking for. So what did we do? We assumed Km equals Kg because we're trying to find the critical draft. And we did that so that we could find F Doc. Once we found F Doc, we used our TPI to figure out what our overall change in mean draft had to be based on that value for F Doc. Once we did that, it was easy. We used our known mean draft before stranding in order to calculate what our mean draft after stranding was going to be in the scenario where F doc is the critical weight removed from the keel. And then we got our value down here. And you can see what happens when you don't do those calculations. So the top left is the 331 foot Princess Lewis restaurant, which capsized in its dry dock. Um, this vessel probably didn't have the side blocks hauled at the right time or probably wasn't completely level when it was going up. And they missed a window and the vessel started capsizing. There wasn't much they could do. You look off to the right, and this tug that's in the dry dock, this one looks more like a, a combination issue. The vessel probably fell off its side blocks because it wasn't properly supported. And then the weight of the entire ship pushing onto the sidewall of the floating dry dock caused it to roll over as well. So suffice it to say that these draft calculations and understanding the weights and how they work with each other is extremely important when dry docking your vessel. And I hope you learned a lot from this. Like I always say, please read your course reader and make sure that you go through and do any learning activities because they'll help you immensely in understanding the material.